and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutun. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Tonight, we're going to continue our look at the controversial degazettement of the Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve. Yesterday, um, Slango Majubasa Amiruddin Shari told PKR party leaders that he will be postponing that degazettement. But what does that mean, the postponement, given that the gazette for the ex excision of permanent uh, reserved forests has already been published on August 12th? And what ecological impact uh, could there be if the development goes ahead? Faisal Parish is the director of the NGO Global Environment Centre. He joins us on the show tonight. Faisal, good evening. Thank you for being uh, with us this, this evening. Now, from an environmental point of view, I wanted to ask you what your assessment is of the Slango State Government's justification for its decision. Um, you know, they're, they're saying that the Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve is isolated from the main forest complex, that it's facing development pressure from surrounding built-up areas, and that this, this uh, forest reserve has a history of fires. Do these justifications make sense to you? Uh, frankly, the justification by the uh, state government is ludicrous. Uh, most of what they're saying is totally wrong and not borne out by the facts. They claim the area is always burning, and uh, they say clearing the forest and uh, doing the development will stop the fire. This is totally wrong. In fact, there's been hardly any fire for the last uh, six years because the Orang Asli themselves, who've been guardians of the area for more than 130 years, took action to prevent other people, outsiders, uh, coming to the area and uh, leading to fires. And they have spent vast amount of time to restore back the degraded forests, which were there by the negligence of the previous management and the development projects around. So that's totally wrong about burning. They also uh, claiming that there are no trees or no tall trees in the area to be degazetted. This is also absolutely wrong. The area to be degazetted is 98% uh, covered with trees. Many of them are very tall, mature, a uh, very diverse rainforest uh, tree species, uh, and uh, there's hardly any low trees or shrub area. They're all tall trees. So that is totally wrong. And then uh, this is meant to support socioeconomic progress in some way. Well, I don't think that the uh, people of the Slango are getting any benefit from this type of activity. In saying it's small, yes, it's relatively small, but there is still incredible diversity there. And small is also beautiful. There are many species that can survive in relatively small areas, but we need a minimum area. So we need the full 950 hectares and not half of it uh, as they're proposing. So, yeah, frankly, so Faisal, they're, they're can I ask you about that? Wrong. Right, yes, so it seems like they are pro uh, they're suggesting that they have compromised by reducing the area that is to be degazetted and that uh, they have not compromised on uh, the policy of uh, of keeping the percentage of forest reserve in the state uh, and they're very big on trumpeting these repl replacement forests which the, uh, their consultants uh, as they quote uh, say, are just as good from a biodiversity point of view. Could you tell us more about these replacement uh, forests, uh, the argument, as well as the reality on the ground? I mean, uh, frankly, to say you can cut off half a forest and you can replace it in three different places, it's saying, like, you can cut off your head and you can still run around. Um, we don't want our head cut off or our legs cut off and saying everything's fine. You can find another head uh, 100 kilometers away. Um, that doesn't work in nature. That doesn't work in, in ecology to say that you can replace them. All they're trying to do is just an administrative thing to keep us full, that they're increasing somehow the area of protected forests. They're not. Those forests that they're so-called gazetting or protecting, they're already existing forests. They're not creating new forests, so they're destroying one and just administratively putting a flag on others and saying everything is fine. And are those equivalent or better areas? Absolutely not. The biggest of those areas, the so-called Sungai Panjang Forest, which they just gazetted last week as the main replacement, and they said this is peat swamp forest, 
This is much better than the so-called degraded North Lang of Peace on Forest. We know this area. We've been complaining what the state has been doing to it. In fact, the state has bulldozed um, about a third of the forest already, and they were uh, given stop work order by the Department of Environment. Their machinery has been uh, impounded, and, uh, and uh, the site has been uh, shut down because the State Agricultural Development Corporation is busily destroying uh, the site that they're saying is the replacement site. So I'm not sure Hi, about Faisal, the other two. Can you yes. explain that a little bit? So we understand that the uh, Gazette for the ex accession of this forest was only published on August 12th. Are you saying there's bulldozing already happening, that forest area has been already cleared? They started the bulldozing in uh, April this year. So they wanted to, I mean, they had a plan, uh, a to totally half-baked plan, uh, that they first they wanted to develop oil palm and destroy the forest for oil palm. Then that was turned down by the Department of Environment. Then they said, let's plant it with, uh, with coconuts and the maize and other things. And they thought they could do that without an EIA. So they already started clearing the area until they were arrested and stopped by the Department of Environment. Um, but it seemed during the MCO, they have even cleared a bigger area of an adjacent, uh, very important conservation forest. So it seemed that the state government absolutely does not understand or respect the law or follow any aspect of the law. So we cannot believe Faisal, anything who, that they're who's saying. they? Faisal, when you say they, who are you referring to? The state government. The State Agricultural okay. Development Corporation, chaired by the chief minister, has been the one destroying the forest that he and uh, that they're announcing is the replacement forest. And they can't say they're ignorant because, GC, we have written many, many times. Uh, we've written many times. We've tried to have meetings. We sent them photographs. We've told them exactly what's going on, but they totally ignore what we're saying. And we've highlighted that these are the same areas that earlier last year they said they would give as the replacement forest, but they've just carried on Find destroying them. Yeah. I, I understand, you know, yesterday we, we heard about the history of the Kuala Langa North Forest Reserve, you know, the process, uh, that, and there were accusations of insincerity. Now you're telling us that, in fact, the state government of Selangor has been dishonest to the public in its representation of what's going on. Today, okay. Yesterday we heard there was going to be a postponement of this, uh, this degazettement. What do you make of this? new twist in the saga. I mean, it would be very nice to, if the postponement was really meaningful, but maybe it's just a PR exercise. Even the way that the statement was phrased, uh, the postponement is to give more time to explain uh, to the stakeholders about the issues raised, not it's more time to review or reconsider the project and uh, gazette back the area. The way that the statement was, was given out yesterday, it implied the area had not been degazetted. But we all know they already degazetted it two weeks ago. And they just hope no one would know that. So to me, it looks like they want to bluff everyone. And they want to, to uh, just carry on and buy time uh, for themselves. I mean, from the very beginning, they have not been sincere about having a dialogue and a process. Global Environment Center first heard rumors about this almost three years ago, that they were planning the degazettement. And we have wrote numerous letters. We have many, many times asked for meetings, many, many times gone to see and talk to different agencies, and they have totally refused to entertain or to meet or to consider or even listen to the concern of the orange athletes, the local communities. They have kept on saying they will breathe, they will inform, but they have never gone down to the ground. They have never informed the local uh, orange athlete community properly. The only thing the orange athlete community have received is threats, threats that their land, their house is going to be bulldozed, that their land is going to be taken away if they do not sign letters to say they welcome the degazettement. And this is totally not what we should be expecting in 21st century of a government, a so-called enlightened government, Pakistan government, which pledged in its uh, election manifesto uh, that it would not be doing any of these grand development projects, that it would respect the right of community, it respects human rights, and it would uh, really look for a sustainable environment approach. But unfortunately, the last two or three years, we have had totally the opposite 
of what has been preached earlier. Faisal, then having said all that, uh, how do you think activists and, and, and uh, the scientific community and Orang Asli stakeholders, how should we respond to um, to this? Is there any reversal, any possibility of a reversal? Of course, if, if there is the political will, it can be reversed in a few moments. It, it's not difficult. Uh, and we saw that in Johor, I believe uh, 18 months ago. In Johor, the Pola Pokup uh, State Park was degazetted one day uh, and then uh, to perhaps allow a resort development. And there was a lot of protest and it was regazetted the following week. Exactly the same could happen here. And I think that's the best way forward. If the thing is going to be reconsidered and there's going to be proper feasibility done, that's going to take six months, a year or whatever to do that properly. So let us put back the status quo. Let's uh, gazette back that area. Let's do the proper study. Let's do it in an open, professional, transparent way and then make the proper decision in an open way, not behind closed doors, hiding behind the COVID pandemic, not threatening people, not lying about what's going on. This needs to be done in a, in a proper way. And how can people respond? I mean, it's difficult to respond if there's no surety that whatever is said or done by the stakeholders is listened to. I mean, it almost seems like the whole last two years of public inquiry was just a sham or a scam to try to placate people by giving people opportunity because they said yeah. absolutely the opposite of what the people said should be done then then they did of course they reduced yeah, I mean, the area it's quite extraordinary. Bit. sorry sorry Faisal, yeah. i want to just ask you uh, it's there is an extraordinary amount of a double speak i think going on i think we all agree with you about that uh, even on the question of degazettement uh, i'm told that in, in the, the proper process would have been to degazette, alienate to the business or commercial interest, as well as regazette uh, or gazette uh, replacement for us. All would have happened at simultaneously. And I'm told that at this point in time, uh, the only course that could succeed is for the commercial interest, the companies involved, to, uh, as it were, pull out of the deal. It's only if they do so that the state will have the opportunity to revisit this question. No, that's what do you it. make of this argument? No, I, I don't believe that at all. I mean, uh, the area was only degazetted last week. I'm sure they will not have a land title. They will not have transferred the land to this one ringy company. Um, maybe if the one ringgit company is unhappy, the state can pay the one ringgit back and then they can close the company down. But it's not like the company has invested hundreds of millions in the feasibility study and the work and the state has led it on. This company only just set up the other month. So this is totally uh, not the... Uh, they do not have any right. And if the government have been so stupid to sign an agreement, so-called assigning rights, and the company wants to, to sue back. I mean, that's the stupid fault of the government. But there is no way that the government the government can tomorrow regazette the area. Just as was done in Johor, this is a sovereign right. The government can just decide to regazette, and it's and it's regazetted. And they have not yet given it to anyone. And even if they gave to someone, that doesn't have any right because the area is still gazetted as a strict conservation area under the Town and Country Planning Act. They cannot do anything in the area. And they have not done an EIA, so they cannot do anything in the right. area. So they Faisal, don't have any just approval. Now you mentioned, Faisal, you, just now you mentioned that you wish this whole process had been, had been done in a more transparent manner. Can you detail for me what exactly you'd like to see redone transparently? Which, which part is it that you, which are the, where are the missing gaps in, your, uh, in this process? I mean, number one, there was never a real proposal what this development was about. And it was, we are told it was from one, one mysterious company in the beginning, and they had some wonderful plan, but that was never presented, that never exists, and now it evaporated, and now suddenly overnight, another company has popped up, also presumably with no plan. And, and uh, so first, where's the development plan? 
that was so important that you can destroy the na national heritage of the state just for this wonderful plan that will bring benefit. That's not there. Secondly, the public inquiry process should needs to be redone. Actually, according to the rules, the inquiry should have been held within a month of closing objections, and it was organized uh, six months later with one-day notice, and then the report should have been available a month after that. The report's not been made available. We've asked for it under Freedom of Information, and they've refused to provide it. So provide the report analyzing that. If they have a consultant who said this uh, bulldozed forest in Tsai Panjang is much better, provide that report, make that available. Don't hide behind the uh, words and uh, lies. They have to really do it seriously. But, I mean, frankly, the, it's like a house of cards. It's not made on anything credible. So to say that it should be run professionally, I mean, there's nothing there to be professional about it. From what There's no evidence being presented that there was a credible or important or valuable uh, activity other than land speculation. The Menshi Bazaar announced in 17th of March to the State Assembly last year that the state would get so much money from this project. He said the state were going to ask the company to pay three ringgit a square foot, and the state would get so much value from that for three ringgit a square foot. When we all know that the value of the land there, if you look across the road in Cyber Jaya, 500 meters away, land is going for 110 ringgit a square foot. So there's a slight difference between three ringgit the state asked for and 110 ringgit, which is the value. And I think this is the heart of what's going wrong here. And unless now the new company is going to pay 110 ringgit, 6.18 billion for the degazetted area, which I very much doubt, I mean, this is not a serious uh, proposition. And if the company really has 6.18 billion to spend, there's plenty of other land available, degraded land, uh, empty land. Right that could be uh, used. And that's what the state okay. and should be doing about directing investment to improving land, not to destroying the, the core values of the state. Okay. And Faisal, the thank indigenous you. Orangasi community who've looked after thank the area so for much, hundreds Faisal. of years. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. So thank you so much for being on the show. We have to take a quick break. That was Faisal Parish of the uh, NGO Global Environment Centre. Um, we'll come back after this break and take a look at the business angle of this uh, increasingly murky saga. So stay tuned to consider this. berunding dalam isu COVID. dan semangat menjadi kesinambungan perpaduan tanah air yang tercinta berteraskan adab yang terpahat di jiwa dan raga marilah bersama kita membina negara Malaysia Hi, thank you so much for staying with Shrad and I on Consider This. Um, but if you've just joined the show tonight, we're discussing the Selangor State Government's move to degazette more than half of the Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve, which is equivalent to uh, the size of 600 and, uh, 865 football fields. Now, of this area, 91% will be given to private company uh, Gabungan Indas and Jambrahad for a mixed development project. We have joining us on the line investigative journalist Emmanuel Samaratha, Samaratisa joining us now. Uh, Emmanuel, thank you for being on the show. 
Uh, can we take a look at the history of this uh, proposed development project? I mean, I understand there was a change of developer along the way. Initially, it was supposed to be um, Titian Jutaria Sundiyambar Hat, and uh, Menteri Besar Incorporated that was slated to be the developers. Can you walk us through what you know about uh, these companies and why there was a change of developers along the way? All right. Um, first off, hi, uh, Melissa and Shira. Thanks for having me. So now uh, to your question, Melissa. Well, I think uh, it started last year. It, it was around March, I guess, where Islam Menteri Basam Muradin Shari uh, revealed that uh, the, the company, the two companies that were to develop around 900 plus hectares of, uh, of the forest reserve, were uh, Menteri Basa Inc. and Titian Jutaria Sindiram Burhad. So now Menteri Basa Inc. Uh, is the uh, state investment vehicle, while Titian Jutaria, they were controlled by the uh, Slango uh, Royal House. Okay, but then so so when this when this blew up, uh, what happened was that there was immense uh, pushback, I think, from NGOs, from stakeholders. And, uh, and then what happened was that I think it led to a motion by uh, Najran Halimi in the State Assembly. And, I, and along the way, if I'm not wrong, uh, Titian Jutaria dissolved. So the company is no longer uh, in existence. And the issue sort of died down. And I think it came back up again in April this year. And retrospectively, we know now that uh, in May, the State Assembly I uh, said so the EXCO agreed to uh, degazette de uh, a smaller uh, uh, plot of land compared to the 900, so I think it was about 500 plus hectares. And uh, the company that was awarded uh, to, the rights to develop this land is uh, Gabungan Inda Sindiran Burhad, which uh, has a sole director. Uh, his name is Mohammad Fadil Muskan and also a sole shareholder, uh, Vibrantscape. You know, no, you, I, I read your piece and it's brilliant. It's very mm. well detailed in the Malaysianist and mm. uh, you tell a compelling story. But I wonder if how do we put these different elements together? You you mentioned the sole director who is an ex Joho Amno youth. Chief, yes. Uh, you mentioned yeah. that the company concerned uh, essentially is held by a Sarwa group, uh, the Samling group, uh, yes. your ho uh, holding Berhad, and they're linked to the former chief minister of Sarawak, not the current governor, Taib. Uh, so we have all these fascinating elements. You as an investigative journalist, uh, very few of you in this country, by the way, um, how do you make the link? I mean, what pulls all these elements together and have them now as key players in this uh, very interesting saga around a, a very important piece of natural history? Hmm. So I guess, uh, I mean, it goes all the way back to, uh, to the, uh, I mean, the founding of, of, of Sumling, the, the, the Sumling Group, right? And that's, that goes way back in uh, 19... Uh, 63, right? And um, I mean, they started off as a timber company and then they diversified into, uh, you know, property, into mi uh, mining, and I think they also distribute uh, Bentleys as well. Um, and so they, so they, so they, they diversified. And uh, they are, they are run, it's, it, they are run, uh, it's a tightly held conglomerate and they are run by a, I mean, father and son duo. I mean, these two are the, are the, are the major, uh, players in the company, but it's basically a family-run company, conglomerate. And I think uh, they, they have, uh, I mean, they, of course, they are, their home base is in Sarawak, but they sort of um, grew. I mean, so they have regional presence. They even have uh, presence in the Sinamananjo, right? And, uh, for example, the Desa Park City um, neighborhood, I mean, that enclave was, was developed by them. And uh, so they have that track uh, record over there. And uh, so the link to Taib was, you know, when uh, Samling was, Samling's uh, plantation arm was listed on the Bursa back in uh, early 2000s and they were delisted in 2012. So one of the, uh, I mean, two substantial shareholders back then uh, were, uh, let me see, it, is, it were, uh, what's that name? Um, Abdul Hamid Sapawi, yes, Abdul Hamid Sapawi and uh, one Roshidi Abdul Rahman. So Abdul Hamid is, um, 
Chaib's cousin, while uh, one Rashidi uh, is uh, confident of the Sarawak government. So those links are, are there, and it's historical. Um, they, they no longer surface in, in the plantation business of, of, of Samling. So now where does the former <laughs> Johor uh, under Yu Chief fit in? Uh, that is a very interesting uh, puzzle that I'm still trying to figure out as well. Um, you know, the, this Gabungan Inda that, that won the rights to, to turn this forest reserve into a mixed development project was only incorporated in November yeah. last year, if I'm not mistaken, yes. right? Um, Correct. So do you, what do you know about the process to which it was awarded? Um, was there an op open tender that, uh, that, you know, that developers uh, tended for this project or was it given uh, directly? Do you know anything about the process? Um, I, 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 I think if, if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong, um, the state government uh, it's not it's not required to initiate a tender process before alienating state land to developers. So normally, what what happens is that private developers would will propose to take over um, state land, and the state uh, cabinet would consider it. So it's it's that's how uh, uh, it, it works. Okay. Hey, Emmanuel, you know, you uh, describe your newsletter, The Malaysianist, as a newsletter on money and power. And, you know, there are a lot of people scratching their heads about the reasons behind the decision. I'm saying on mm -hmm. so many bases, on environmental uh, uh, points of view, uh, from a cultural point of view, in terms of the, the, uh, the, um, the value it is to the Tamuan community and uh, all of us in Slango, uh, it does not make sense. But clearly, when it comes to money and power, uh, it could very well make sense to push this along. What do you understand to be the business proposition behind this move? Why is the Slango state government so interested to degazette this forest uh, in the interests of this particular developer, do you think? Yeah, I think you raise a, raise a significant point there. You see, because um, throughout this whole entire year, uh, chronicling the, 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 the fiasco, uh, the only constant uh, player over here is the Slango state government. And it's absolutely clear that the Slango government is bent on um, degazetting that portion of, 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 of the forest and uh, to develop it. So, uh, I mean, it is really, it's really confusing. I mean, why, why, why do that? You know, uh, who ultimately benefits from this? So it's that lack of transparency from the state government's part is, is 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 really puzzling over there. Um, yes. I'm assuming, yeah. So yeah. And Manuel, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. We really appreciate your time and you sharing um, what you've discovered in your uh, research. That was investigative journalist Emmanuel Samaratisa, and that's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. Don't forget, though, that we have the latest, all the latest information on COVID-19 vaccines on the uh, on astroawani.com as well as our Astro Awani app. I'm Melissa Idris, and I'm Sharad Kutin signing off for the evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Good night.